I'm Don Hoffman, and I'm at the University of California at Irvine in the Department of Cognitive Sciences with joint appointments in philosophy and computer science as well. And I try to integrate all of those disciplines in, in the work that I do. And when you integrate the, all these disciplines, how does this add up to something new? Well, in, in the field of cognitive science, I'm studying visual perception. How do we see a 3D world? How do we see the colors of objects, the shapes of objects, the motions of objects? What are the processes that are going on inside of our brains when, when we do that? And it turns out about a third of the brain's cortex is engaged just in vision. So when you simply open your eyes and look around the room, billions of neurons and trillions of synapses are springing into action. And so one of the things we try to do in the cognitive neurosciences is understand what's going on, why all of this horsepower a third of your highest processing horsepower is involved in visual perception. That's a bit surprising. So the question is, why do we need to have that much horsepower in something that seems so simple? Just open your eyes and see the world. And it turns out that we have to do a lot of computation because in some sense we're creating the worlds that we see. And so computer science comes into it because we need to understand from a computational point of view what's going on when you open your eyes and see the shapes of objects, the colors and the motions of objects. You're not just seeing them, you're actually creating a virtual reality in, in some sense for yourself. You're, you're a reality engine. But is, it, is, is this true or is this just your theory? What I'm seeing now is pretty widely accepted in cognitive neurosciences. They, they, almost every cognitive neuroscientist will say that we are constructing what we see um, in real time. So you close your eyes, you just see a gray field. You open your eyes and it looks like you're just seeing a 3D world with objects and colors and motions as it is, just taking a snapshot. But most cognitive neuroscientists will say, but that's not what's going on. What's happening really is that within about 100 milliseconds, about one-tenth of a second, you're creating the 3D world around you. You're creating the objects and the colors and the motions. You're doing it so quickly and apparently so effortlessly that you're you know, taken in. You think you're just seeing the world as it is. That would say that's the majority, the vast majority view in cognitive neurosciences right now, that we construct what we see. And so computer science comes into it in part because to make sure that we understand what we're doing, that our theories about the construction process are accurate, it's good for us to try to build them to actually build robotic vision systems that work. So if you have a theory about how you see the 3D structure of objects, well, then build it. And if you can actually have a computer that has video cameras giving inputs into the computer and then software in the computer that creates inside the computer a, the 3D model of the object that is what you think it should have done, then maybe you've got a good theory. So the computer science comes in in the following way. We're trying to reverse engineer what's going on in the human brain well enough that we can then implement it in a computer vision system and build robotic visions. And if you can do that, then that, that's an existence proof that you might actually have a good theory. And then the but philosophy... Is, 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 that, is that the new theory? Is that your theory? Or? That's actually... Um, the person who is most famous for sort of pushing this point of view is a guy named David Marr, who was a professor at MIT um, late 70s and early 1980s. And David Marr, he, he was in the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT and in what's now the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department. And he was the one that, he had a background in mathematics and neuroscience and worked in the AI lab. Marvin Minsky invited him to come there because Marr had this, this new point of view that we should, you know, vision is a constructive process. And we need to understand the mathematics of the construction well enough that we can actually build it. So if you can build working systems, robotic systems, then, which is you know, a contribution to artificial intelligence, then that will really show that you understand what's going on when we open our eyes and see. What is exactly what you are looking for? In the construction of vision? Um, in, uh, yes, yes, in the construction right. of vision. Of, of, of our perspective of reality. Right. So, well, what, what Marr got us into, what David Marr got the field to think about is 
trying to get our understanding of human vision, human visual processing so rigorous that we could actually build robotic vision systems. So that means that, that what seems to us like an immediate perception of shapes and colors and motions is in fact a sophisticated computation. And so that's where the computer science comes in. We actually want to take raw images coming in from video, from like video cameras, which is just a bunch of numbers. If you look at it, it's just an uninterpretable array of, of numbers, millions of numbers. So, so the idea is that we want to build robotic vision systems that will take, for example, video from cameras into the computer. And that video, if you look at it, is just an array of numbers, millions of numbers. You look at it, it's who knows what it means. It's just a, a bunch of numbers. And you want to take those numbers and then create a world what, that those numbers are trying to describe to you, like a boy riding a bicycle, eating a hot dog, or whatever might be going on there. So, so to do that, you can see, going from those numbers to a three-dimensional world with colors and objects and boys riding bicycles is not a trivial thing. And so that's what robotic vision and, and computer vision has been doing ever since David Marr really got us going in this direction in the late, mid to late 1970s. And it was his work that got me into this field. I read his work when I was an undergraduate and said, where is this guy? I'd like to work with him. And I, I ended up going and being a student at MIT. So, so I, 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 got, I had the pleasure of working with David Marr for a couple of years, the last two years of his life until he, he died of, of leukemia. Um, while I was still his graduate student. But he set, he set the field on this, on this new path. And ever since then, there have been, you know, the majority of the field has been trying to build rigorous um, mathematical models that you could in principle, or, or in practice, actually build robotic vision systems from. So now I've got an intelligent vision system on my car, partly as a result of, of this kind of work that can see if I'm on the, on the road, if I'm going over the lines and so forth, it'll beep at me. So we're starting to get intelligent vision systems coming out of this, where the, the car itself can see in 3D. So, so it's, it's the result of this long, decades-long effort of trying to understand mathematically and precisely how, wh why we have to spend a third of our brain's cortex, all that horsepower, in seeing the 3D world and objects and colors. Now we're, we're really understanding that. Um, so that's the standard view. I mean, there are some dissenters, but I would say it's by far the, the majority view that we create what we see, we construct the worlds that we see. But, but doesn't that mean that, that people or people's minds are uh, like, uh, like uh, robots or like machines? Um, you could, well, a lot of people in artificial intelligence would say exactly that, that um, we are machines, we're just carbon-based machines. So that would be the standard view in artificial intelligence. We, we are complex machines, <clears throat> and they would say that we should not take that as indication that we're not valuable, but um, we are just carbon-based machines, and we can um, reverse engineer the algorithms that are going on in the brain. Once we reverse engineer those algorithms from the neural networks of the brain, then we can implement them in artificial neural networks, for example, in, in, in silicon. And so we transfer from carbon to silicon, but the algorithms, if we've done it right, are still the same or close to the algorithms that are, that are in the brain. So that's sort of the idea. And then the idea then is that those algorithms do a good job of truthfully reconstructing the true shapes, the true colors, the true motions of objects in the world. That's the standard view. So it's not my view now, but that is the standard view. So what is Maybe it's a very long story, but can you can you try to uh, make this one uh, short? Because I want to go to something else. Okay. But what is your what is your view? Well, my my view is that we do construct what we see. So I agree with the field, with the majority of the field, that we construct in real time all the shapes, colors, and motions and objects that we see. But I don't think that we're reconstructing the truth. So. Everybody in my field pretty much believes that we're reconstructing a good, faithful reproduction of the true shapes and colors. And I don't think we are. Instead, I think that what's going on is um, it's more like a desktop interface on your computer. So if you have an icon for, say, you're writing a file or editing a photograph, so you're writing an email to a friend, and the, the icon for that file is blue and rectangular 
and in the middle of your screen. That doesn't mean that the file itself in your computer is blue and rectangular and in the middle of the computer. That, that, that's a silly notion. Anybody who thought that doesn't understand what the desktop interface is for. And I think that that's what we have. Our perceptions are like that desktop interface. So space and time are the desktop. Three-dimensional space, as you perceive it, and time are the desktop. And then physical objects like a glass, a car, a spoon, these are all just icons in that three-dimensional desktop. And the point of the interface, the desktop and the, and the icons, is not to show you the truth. The point is really to hide the truth, right? If you had to know, in the case of the computer, if you had to know all the diodes and resistors and voltages and, and you know, magnetic fields, if you had to know all that and deal with that, you'd never finish writing your email to your friend. So you don't need to know the reality. You want to, in fact, the desktop interface is there to hide that reality. Reality gets in the way of what you really need to do. And so it's I think... It's very mind-boggling if you do yes. it like that. Yes. So what, what you say is that what you see is just an interface. It's not real. That's right. But what you see, the whole three-dimensional world that we perceive and all the physical objects that we perceive in it and all their properties are just like the the colored icons on your desktop. So where we are right now, we are sitting on the couch. Right. I think. Right. I, I think you're sitting on the couch. That's right. And that's that's a very useful um, belief. Right. It's very useful for me to know you know, to think that the icon is the file and I can just double click on the file and it'll open. Or if I drag the file to the trash can, I can delete it. So it's very, it's a, a very nice and useful fiction. It allows me to do what I need to do. But it is just a useful fiction. But it, it allowed me to, to see you as a person sitting on a couch in a, in a house and, and, and some pictures on the wall. That, that's right. And a glass of water. But, but you, te you are telling me that I, I, somehow I'm fooling myself. Right, you're fooling yourself if you believe that what you're seeing is a true replication of what is there when you don't look. Right? So I do think that there is an objective world. And I think there is a reality that exists whether or not I, I'm here and whether or not I'm looking. So there is some objective reality. But the chances that my perceptions are reconstructing part of that reality so I'm seeing the truth, the chances are actually, you can prove, the, are zero. And the argument comes from evolution. So I started looking at evolution by natural selection and what it has to say about may, our perceptions. Maybe we can come to that a little bit a little later. Bit later. Because, because okay. I still want to okay, it, sure. it's so, um, also for our viewers, if, right, if, right. if you are saying that everything around is, us is a, re, a representation, right. Maybe you will wait with the answer after the plane. After the plane, right, right. But I can go on. Yes. Um, uh, <coughs> the idea that, that, that I can look around and see everything as an interface, uh, like on the computer. Right. And that's that it represents maybe something mm -hmm. else. That's right. And you even don't know what it represents. That's right. That's right. But... Um, yeah, that's, that's it's a very alarming point of view. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you say that. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll say that, yeah. Yeah, so this, this point of view is quite surprising. The idea that what you're seeing when you look around, you see a fireplace, you see a cup, you see people. I uh, see a beautiful woman be and she's not beautiful. Well, what you, yes, what you're seeing is a representation that you construct f for one purpose. The representation is there to keep you alive and to guide your behaviors so that you can stay alive long enough to reproduce. It's an evolutionary argument that we can go into. But the whole point is just like the desktop interface on your... Oh, yeah. Well, you can, you can end your sentence. Right, right. But, uh, okay. Uh, and then... then I, I will point at, uh, at, at uh, And then I'll, I'll continue uh, my sentence to the yeah. end and then stop. Okay. Yeah. Very, very good. But uh, I want to uh, st stick to this, this alarming idea because that 
that's what, when we right. uh, when we start with this in the at the beginning of this uh, this this uh, portrait, uh, people will want to know how this ends. Oh, absolutely. That, that's 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 the, the alarming idea that 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 whatever you see around you uh, is a representation of what you think. Right. But not the truth. But, and it's not the truth, and it's all so mm -hmm. different from what other people's rep representations. W w yes. Well, it. So, th so uh, exactly. So, what you see from this point of view, what you're seeing, when you see shapes of objects and their colors and their motions, in a 3D world around you, is simply your interface, your representation. It's not the truth. It's. It's there to keep you alive long enough to reproduce. There is a question, do other people see the same thing that you do? And the answer is probably their perceptions are very, very similar. So if I am seeing a red rose and you look at it and you say that there's a red rose, there's a good chance that your experiences of the red rose are very, very similar to, to my experiences. And the reason is not that because there's an objective red rose in the world, but because whatever the objective world is, when I interact with it, I construct an interface that's very similar to the interface that you construct when you interact with that world, because we're members of the same species. We're not exactly the same. Your genes are slightly different from mine. There are mutations. Um, and so we're not going to see exactly the same thing. And, and there are cases where we actually know this for a fact. So in the case of color perception, we know that roughly one third of men have one allele for the red photoreceptor and the other two-thirds have a different allele and they actually see the red, orange, yellow end of the spectrum a little bit differently from each other. It's a measurable difference. So we know that there are differences in the DNA which lead to measurable differences in the interface. But nevertheless, we could, oh, we could say that our perceptions um, are substantially similar. Our perspective or our representation of the of our 3D world around us. Um, uh, how do we know what we see? How do we know if we see the what truth? Oh, right. So, well, if I see a snake, for example, you might say, well, you know, if you think that that snake is just an icon on your interface. Why don't you touch it? Why don't you play with it? Because it'll bite you, and after you're dead, you know, we'll know that that snake was more than just an icon on your desktop interface. It's, it's, it's real. It's a real part of objective reality. And, and I wouldn't touch that snake um, for the same reason I wouldn't take my blue rectangular icon on my screen and drag it carelessly to the trash can on my screen. I don't drag it carelessly to the trash can, not because I take the icon literally, the file is not literally blue and rectangular, but I do take it seriously. If I drag that icon to the trash can, I could lose who knows how much, a, a year of work if it's a long paper I'm writing or a book or something. It could be a lot of work that I lose. So the interface, uh, I don't take it literally, I, you know, the files aren't blue and rectangular, but I do take it seriously. And the same thing is true about our perceptions in our everyday life. So if I see a snake, that's an icon I better take quite seriously. If I see a snake, don't touch it. If there's a train coming down the tracks, don't step in front of it. So take my, my perceptions quite seriously. But it's a logical error to then say we must, therefore, take them literally. That doesn't follow. The fact that we take them seriously and must take them seriously does not entail that we have to take them literally. That's a logical error. But it's one that we seem to be inclined to as a species. We know that we have to be very, very, if you see a cliff, don't step off. If you see a car, don't step in front of it. So we know that we have to take our perceptions quite seriously. And it's just natural for us somehow as human beings to say that means that we're seeing the truth. Well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. Psychologically, it does. But logically, it doesn't. And so that's the, the error that we all fall into. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting, very human error, one that I feel. I mean, it, this is very, very unnatural for me as well. I mean, I, I assume that because the car could hurt me, it's real. But no, the car is just my interface to something out there. I don't know what it is. And my interface is telling me certain behaviors I better do or not do so that, that whatever that real world is out there, um, doesn't have impacts on me that I don't like. But what is it then? If you cannot 
literally. Yes. But you can get hurt by this car. Right. And so there's something out there. That's and the car is just the interface. That's right. So the first step then is that if you buy this interface idea, space and time, as we see them, are not the nature of reality. Physical objects, so matter, momentum, mass, position, all this stuff, that's not the nature of reality either. So the first step then is to just say what we thought was reality isn't reality. There is some reality that's out there. And the first step, and we actually don't know what it is, right? As scientists, we don't know what it is, and it's best for us to just recognize that we don't know what it is. That even the very language of our perceptions, the language of space and time, the language of matter, position, momentum, spin, and, and so forth, is in fact the wrong language to describe reality. You can't possibly describe reality in that language. In, in the same way that, for example, suppose I had a class, a computer science class, and I gave the students the following assignment. You can only use the language of the pixels on the desktop screen of your interface. That's the only language you can use, the pixels. And I want you to use that language to describe exactly how a computer works. What's really going on inside a computer? That's the only language. Well, good luck. Everybody's going to fail. You can't use the language of pixels. It's the wrong language to describe the voltages and magnetic fields and so forth that's, that's inside the computer. Similarly, if we try to use the language of space and time and matter and motion, particles and so forth, to describe ultimate reality, we're guaranteed to fail because the, that language does not have the possibility to describe the truth of the world around us. As scientists, then, we have to step back and ask, well, what language might work? What do we, it's also possible, by the way, that we don't have the concepts necessary to describe reality, right? We don't expect that monkeys have the language and the knowledge, the concepts, needed to understand quantum mechanics. No one would ever try to teach quantum mechanics to a monkey. They simply lack the concepts that are needed to even address the subject. And it's quite possible that Homo sapiens, our species, has not evolved the concepts that are needed to understand the true nature of reality. Now, I can't dismiss that possibility. I mean, we're just another species like the monkeys. Um, I don't want to give up. I mean, as a scientist, I'm not going to say, therefore, I'm just, you know, let's, let's have a drink and, and not worry. I'm going to say, let's, let's try, but we need to be very, very uh, aware of the possibility of limitations in our conceptual system and limitations from our perceptual system. What's very clear to me is that the, the perceptual language that we've evolved has no chance of being the right language to describe reality. No chance? No chance. The, we can actually show that the probability that our language of perception is the right language to describe reality is zero. It's precisely zero. So that... Precisely zero. Precisely zero. That's right. Plain. So, but the idea that you, what you are telling me, mm -hmm. that what I see around me is not true. Right. Uh, then I think, well, you're the smart guy, so probably you're right. But I don't understand. But what do your mm. colleagues say to you when you tell them this? Well, idea? most of my colleagues believe that our perceptual systems evolved to tell us the truth about reality around us. Not all of the truth. No one thinks that we see all of the truth. We can only see light in a narrow band. We can't see cosmic rays or x-rays or you know, radio waves. So no one believes that we see all of reality. But most of vision scientists and cognitive scientists think that our perceptual systems have evolved to report the truth because they feel that sensory systems that report the truth give you a competitive advantage against you know, when you're competing with other organisms. So the organisms that see reality as it is are more fit and more likely to pass on their genes to the next generation. So that's the standard view. In every generation, the organisms that saw reality more closely the way it is had a competitive advantage and were more likely to pass on their genes that coded for those sensory systems to the next generation. So after thousands of generations, we can be pretty confident that we're the offspring 
of those who saw more truly in each generation. So we can be confident that we see reality as it is, not exhaustively, but, but truly. But are you on your own? I'm not completely on my own. I would say my estimate is that maybe 5%, maybe 5% of my colleagues might be, you know, game. They might believe that we're not seeing reality as it is. And some very, you know, very, very good colleagues. So Jan Kunderink, for example, from the Netherlands, um, arguably the brightest vision scientist alive today, does agree with me. He thinks that um, evolution by natural selection uh, does not favor true perceptions and that we just have interface perceptions. And a number of my colleagues that I've talked with initially are quite skeptical and they, and they you even have the, you know, the reaction, well, I thought you were a smart guy until you said that, and that's really a stupid idea that we don't see reality as it is. But after talking with them for an hour or two about evolution and the mathematics, then a lot of my colleagues do at least come around to say, well, okay, maybe. I mean, at least it, I can't reject this idea out of hand. But I think it's catching on. My hope is actually not so much to get my generation of scientists to, to you know, follow this idea, but to get the graduate students, the next generation. That's what I'm really after so much. And they seem to be quite open to it. The next generation of scientists, the young scientists, have seen The Matrix. They've seen movies like that. Their minds are more open to the possibility that we don't see reality as it is. And I think that the next generation is going to really catch, this, catch on to this. And when we have, right now our desktops on our computers are flat. But very, very soon, we're going to have holographic desktops. You'll be interacting with a 3D desktop. You'll pull, open your laptop, and there'll be a 3D virtual world that opens up in front of you. And you'll be moving icons around in 3D. And suddenly, the idea that a 3D world could just be a virtual world, just an interface and not the truth, will become not a strange, weird idea, but part of your everyday experience every time you open your laptop. So I think that you know what I'm saying right now, I mean, in 15, 20 years, people will ask, why was that so hard for people to even understand back then? It's so silly. Yeah. What happened to the truth then? So what happens to the truth then is, first we have to be very, very careful in our claims about truth. Any of the normal language we use of space and time and matter and particles is almost surely the wrong language. And as I mentioned, it's possible that we don't have the right language, that none of our concepts are adequate. But I don't want to be a solipsist. So a solipsist, from the philosophical point of view, is someone who claims that nothing exists except me and my perceptions. I'm not a solipsist. I think that there does exist something besides me and my perceptions. And I have to first say, I don't know what it is. So as a scientist, Right off, the, the confession is, uh, now that I've given up space and time and matter and, and physical objects as the nature of reality, I honestly don't know what the nature of objective reality is. But as a scientist, it's my job to theorize. I can make proposals. I'm probably going to be wrong. But the idea in science is to make specific, precise, mathematically precise if you can, mathematically precise proposals about the nature of reality knowing full well that you're probably wrong, but being so precise that you can then do experiments to prove that you're wrong, and then figure out how you might change your theory so that you can get something that's not quite as wrong. So that's what I've been working on. And the direction I'm pursuing is motivated in the following way. Perhaps I know nothing. There's a good chance that everything I believe is false. But if I know anything at all, I know that I'm experiencing headaches, smells, sounds, visual perceptions, and so forth. As experiences, not as a truth about an external world, just as my experiences. So a headache is a good example because a headache is you know, something that no one else can see. You can't see my headache, I can't see your headache, I can't experience it. It's my own personal experience, and it's real as an experience. It's not real as a claim about the external world, but it is real as an experience to me. If you said, oh, your headache isn't real, 
I'd be very angry with you, man. It's a real headache. I, you know, I might, I might need aspirin for it. So, so my idea is to say, I could be wrong about everything, but if I'm not wrong, if, if I'm wrong about experiences, about having experiences, then it's really game over. There's not really any place I can go. So I'm going to start with that. I'm going to start with there are experiences. And so I have a mathematical model of what I call a conscious agent. Something like me that can have experiences, conscious experiences of smells and tastes and colors and sounds. Structure of consciousness. Yes. yes, yes, the mathematical structure of it. That's what I was about to describe. Signs of observation with the six elements. That's right, exactly right. So I'll try to describe them informally. Yes. So so the idea then is to have what I call a conscious agent that has conscious experiences, sights, smells, sounds, and tastes, that can then make choices based on what it experiences. And then once it's made a choice about what it wants to do, it can then act on the world, whatever that world is. And then that world will again affect our experiences. And so there's a loop between the world affecting my experiences, my experiences affecting the decisions I make about how to act, and then those actions then working on the world. It's a loop. And then I also think about having a counter. For every experience I have, I can have my own little personal time, which is a, a counter of the experiences. And, and I've discussed it here informally, but we've made this a mathematical model. And what we're trying to do is to develop this, what we call a theory of conscious agents, and having networks. So the, so the idea is, there is a universe that exists independent of me, whether or not I existed, but it's a universe of consciousness, of conscious agents. Agents that have experiences, make decisions, and act interacting with each other. So, so I'm just one, I'm one participating in this. And in fact, I'm not just one. I'm, when we look at the whole theory, I'm perhaps an infinite lattice of these conscious agents all interacting. Um, but, and then so are you, so is everybody. It is not just one, con you're one conscious agent, but you're also two, roughly corresponding to the two hemispheres of your brain. And then within each hemisphere, more conscious agents to perhaps an indefinite, indefinitely large number. Okay, so if I understand it right, <clears throat> our own consciousness doesn't exist, but we are uh, bodies, somehow bodies uh, who are in influenced by uh, another consciousness. That's right. So, so th this theory, I would, so again, I could be wrong, but what I'm proposing is that consciousness is fundamental. It's the fundamental nature of reality. And, but I don't want to just have that be some kind of loose, you know, semi-spiritual kind of idea. I'm trying to get it mathematically precise idea. So what do I mean by consciousness? So I'm getting a mathematical model of what I mean by consciousness that's absolutely precise, mathematically precise. And I call this mathematical model a conscious agent. And then it turns it, oh, um, it's all, it works out very, very well actually. The mathematics is all, is, is quite clear. And we've published a paper with, with the mathematics. It's been out for a couple of years. So you can, you can describe consciousness as an equation? Uh, yes, and, and as dynamical systems, and we can write down the equations of the dynamics. It's, it's a very, very rich mathematical area. So, I mean, most of the time when you hear people say, I think consciousness is fundamental, it's, it's more about, well, let's meditate and hold hands and, and, and things like that. The, what I'm trying to do is to take that idea and make it very, very rigorous. Here's a mathematical model of consciousness. These are the equations of the dynamics. Yeah, so, so, so the goal is to get a mathematically precise model of consciousness that we can then use um, to solve one of the biggest unsolved problems in science, the, the so-called mind-body problem. This is a problem that has perplexed human beings for thousands of years, and, and that is 
what is the relationship between our conscious experiences, the taste of garlic, the smell of an onion, the sound of a trumpet, and our physical bodies, the physical world? What is that relationship? How should we understand it? Most neuroscientists and philosophers of mind today are trying to solve that problem by saying that neural activity in the brain is the foundation. That's the reality. So neurons in space and time, physical objects, and their dynamics create or are, they're identical to, consciousness. So somehow when you get a complicated system of neurons, somehow their dynamics or their properties boot up consciousness. But the surprising thing is that we've never been able to get a theory of, of how that could be. There are ideas, maybe somehow information theoretic properties of the dynamics of neural networks. Maybe somehow those could boot up consciousness. We do have correlations, right? We know that when you're conscious, your brain has certain information theoretic properties of its dynamics. That's certainly true. Now you turn it around. That's right. Like saying, um, saying, uh, it's the other way. The mind-body problem, we didn't solve it we so didn't. far. That's right. So instead of going from physics to the consciousness, I'll start with consciousness and get physics. I'll go the other way. So can you say yeah, I'll, that again? Yeah, I'll boot that up, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so most neuroscientists and philosophers of mind are trying to start with properties of neurons, neural networks and neural activity, and to try to then get a theory of how consciousness could emerge from that or somehow be identical to that neural activity. And there are a lot of you know, ideas about how we might get a scientific theory. Um, information theoretic properties of, of the, the dynamics, um, certain quantum properties of microtubules, maybe certain you know, frequencies of, of um, firings of neurons and, and, and things like that. But there's not yet been any scientific theory that's actually been proposed which says this neural activity with these, say, information theoretic properties, has to be the taste of chocolate. It could not be the taste of a strawberry. It could not be a headache. And these are the mathematical reasons why. So we need laws that take us from neural activity, whatever the properties of neural activity are that we want to propose are the foundation, takes us from those properties of the neurons into the specific conscious experiences and explain exactly why this neural activity lawfully must be that conscious experience. That has never been done. So, there, so it, when I say there are no scientific theories, that's what I'm saying. No one has ever proposed laws that say this neural activity, uh, based on this law, must be the taste of chocolate. It could not be the smell of garlic. Nothing is, is even close to trying to do that. So, there, so I'll put it very boldly. There are no scientific theories that start with a physical description of the brain neural activity and give you consciousness. There's nothing remotely plausible and there are no good ideas about how that might be done. That's the state of play and we should be very, very frank about it. There are no scientific theories. There are no remotely plausible ideas about how to do that. And that's what got me thinking about this. I mean, I, I tried. I, I'm a physicalist by, at, at heart like everybody else. But when everybody's failing deeply, and I have no good ideas, no one has any good ideas about how to start with a brain and get consciousness, I decided let's try the other direction. So let's try to solve the mind-body problem with a theory of consciousness on its own terms. So first start with consciousness and say, propose as a scientific hypothesis that consciousness is fundamental, get a mathematical model of it, and then solve the mind-body problem the other direction. So instead of starting with physics, and getting consciousness, start with consciousness mathematically described, not a hand wave, a mathematical model of consciousness, and get back all of quantum physics and relativity theory. That's the, that would be solving the mind-body problem so in the other like direction. Combining theory. That's right. So ultimately, we, as a scientist, we want one theoretical framework that covers everything we know. Right? From a physicalist point of view, which most people are, you want to start with what we know about physics, you know, string theory, relativity theory, and so forth. Uh, and then neural networks and their activity and get consciousness out. So we have one big picture that, of the universe that gets it all in. We haven't been able to do that because we can't get consciousness in. So I'm trying to start with a mathematical model of consciousness and its dynamics 
and then see if I can't get out um, you know, string theory, um, quantum gravity, and maybe ideally make some new predictions that the physicists haven't made. If I can do that, then we're off to a real scientific adventure. Breakthrough. Yeah, it would be a, it would be a, a scientific breakthrough if we, could, if we could do that. Partly because it would be unifying two things that we've never been able to unify, namely consciousness, our conscious experiences, and what we take to be the physical world. If this unification works, what it would reveal is what we took to be an independent, objective, space-time physical reality is simply a species-specific user interface. And different species will have evolved different user interfaces. Maybe they don't use space and time. Maybe they don't use color. Maybe they use senses and formats of interfaces that we can't even imagine. And it's very easy for us to blow out our imagination. But isn't that then the reason why we still survive? Right. So we have our interface in terms of space and time and objects, snakes and trains that we have to avoid to keep us alive. That's, it's evolved to keep us alive. But there are many ways to stay alive, right? Evolution shapes different organisms for different niches with different gambits, different strategies for staying alive. Ours is just one of millions. We, we know there have been many, many millions of species that have lived even just on this one planet. Um, and we know that the nature of their perceptual experiences in general is very, very different from ours. Um, there are snakes that, that see in infrared, um, you know, fish that, that see electric fields and sense electric fields, things that we can't even imagine what it would be like. And, and even birds, for example, that have four color receptors. We only have three. Try to imagine a specific color that you've never seen before. Nothing happens, right? You, you, you can't even imagine a specific concrete color that you've never seen before. And yet, apparently, pigeons are in a, a richer color world. They're experiencing colors that perhaps no human can even imagine. And there are animals that he, even have more color receptors. The, the mantis shrimp has 10 or more color receptors. So try to imagine their color world. I can't even imagine it. In some sense, my, my sensory systems are a window on the world, but they're also a prison. I can't actually see outside of it, and I can't even concretely imagine perceptual experiences outside of it. I can do it abstractly. I could imagine abstractly a world that's not three-dimensional. I can imagine a four-dimensional world. I mean, Einstein did that, and it's hard, but you can, you can imagine a four-dimensional world, or you know, mathematicians can go to any dimension you want. We can go there conceptually, but nobody, not even the most brilliant mathematician, can concretely imagine in their mind a four-dimensional world, just like you can't imagine concretely a specific new color that you've never seen before. So our, our desktop interface is a species-specific interface. It's our window on the world. It's our way to stay alive. It gives us the symbols we need in our particular niche. Homo sapiens has taken a particular kind or set of niches. Um, the par you know, paramecium, E. coli, all these various organisms, they have different niches. They don't need the same user interface that we have. So the interface is going to vary widely from, from, from organism to organism. But if I'm correct about this conscious agent thesis, it's consciousness all the way down. Different, different user interfaces that are allowing different conscious agents to do what they need to do, um, but in their own format. So it's possible that different worlds exist together. That's right. That I see... But, but, but you and I, we are in the same world. We agree on that, right? You and I have very, very similar interfaces, is my assumption. Again, as a scientist, I can never say I know for sure. Because it's a species-like interface, what you say. Exactly right. We are the same species. Yeah, we're about to. <laughs> so, because you and I are members of the same species, it's reasonable for me to assume. Are we? Are, are we? Yes, that's right. Well, that, 
But yeah, it's interesting. My, my perceptions have classified you as being similar to me. Again, it's fallible. As a scientist, I never can say for sure anything. I can only give probabilities of, of, of my statements. But I think it's highly likely that when I'm interacting with you, I'm interacting with um, someone whose perceptions, their, whose interface is very, very similar to mine. There's no way for me to actually prove that your experiences are identical to mine. In fact, I have a mathematical proof that I published about eight years ago that actually proves that we, that we can't do that. So it, it's, it's actually a theorem that there's no way for us to verify that your experiences um, are the same as mine. Even, Even the fact that, that, that I find it very hard to understand what you were trying to explain to me, that we are use a different interface. Um, the, yeah, the fact that I, I'm... More intelligent. Well, I wouldn't say that. I would say that the fact that maybe what I'm saying is a little difficult for you or, or other people to understand is not so much a matter of a difference of the user interface that we have or a difference in intelligence. It's more just a matter of a difference in what we've spent our time thinking about. So, so for example, um, if, if someone is crocheting, I've never done any crocheting. And so things that are obvious to someone who spent their life crocheting are not obvious to me. I, could never, I couldn't pick up the darning needles and, 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 and the threads and, and do it. Um, I wouldn't say that the person who's crocheting is smarter than me or, or dumber than me. They just have had a different you know, thing that they've focused on. And so uh, the same thing here with the user interface idea. It's, it's difficult to understand partly because our species um, seems to want to think that what we experience is the truth. So we seem to have that inclination. Um, but I do think that you are very, very similar to me in your, in your perceptual experiences, and, but I could be wrong. And I do know it's, it's a theorem that even if in every experiment you behave exactly the same way as me, so in every experiment, um, say in color perception, you give exactly the same answers as me, and we even do brain scans, and your brain is behaving exactly the same way as mine. You might say, well, that must prove that your color experiences are identical to mine. And it turns out, no, it doesn't prove that they're identical. It makes it likely, from my point of view as a scientist, that they're, that they're the same. But it isn't, it's not a proof. Well, and, and in fact, that might be one thing we could talk about is something called synesthesia. So these are people who see, when, when you see, you just see, but they also maybe hear something. Or if they see a letter, they see a color. And so this, all, and these, are, these are real people. This is not you know, science fiction. So synesthesia is real people that have what we would call mixing of the senses. But that really shows that our user interface could be very, very different. So we could talk about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> Maybe you, you, you can explain about this uh, evolutionary argument. That's right. So it's, it's one thing to say that um, our perceptions don't report the truth, that they're just a user interface. And anybody can say that. And you might ask, well, what's the logical argument? On what grounds are you making such a, a wild claim? And the argument is based on evolution by natural selection. Most researchers in my field have the argument that I mentioned earlier that um, those of us who saw reality as it is ha had a competitive advantage compared to those who don't. 